Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. And welcome back, everybody. So many of us dealing with anxiety, depression, PTSD, response to traumas in in our lives or in, in the past. There's many different ways to approach it, but... There's one thing that's been trending recently, more and more. It's been around for a long time. I'm talking about ketamine, a medication that can be used to help people with mental health challenges. And we're going to learn all about that today from somebody who knows more than me, that's for sure. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) It's great to have her here. Now, you've been working with so many people, Carrie. This, by the way, this is Carrie Krill. Tell Tell us your company. Yeah, so I actually have two companies. One's Integrity Mental Health. It's a general mental health company. It's been open for six years now. Um, and then in 2020, I also opened Zora Neural Spa. Um, Zora focuses in on ketamine therapy, um, IV and IM ketamine for depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, pain, um, most most things in that class. We, we primarily do depression and anxiety and PTSD, but the other things come through occasionally. So ketamine, I believe there, and it's funny we were even talking about this. I believe things happen for a reason. I just text somebody who has some challenges and I said, have you thought about ketamine? And she wrote yeah. back, oh, you mean the special K club drug from back in the day? And I believe right. there's an aversion there because of that, where it was yeah. abused, if you will. Uh, sure. But ketamine is... Something that's been around as an anesthesia for decades, so like the 1960s. Tell us more. Yeah, yeah. So ketamine, yeah, originally came out as a general anesthetic. Um, so a lot of people also call it like a horse tranquilizer because they do use it in veterinary medicine a lot. Um, but it's been used in in as an anesthetic for people since the 1960s. Um, they use it a ton in surgeries. Um typically at higher doses than what we're doing. So we're doing what they call microdosing. So your typical dosing and anesthesia is over two milligrams per kilogram. We're doing like somewhere between 0.5 and one milligram per kilogram, and we're doing it over 40 minutes. So what our goal is, is to get you into a pretty relaxed state. Some people dissociate with it, meaning they become disconnected from their body, um, it can be a lot of different experiences. Some people re-experience trauma during it. Some people just feel like really floaty and they see lots of colors, um, but it's different for everybody. And it's actually different from treatment to treatment. Mm. Um, so basically we're giving it and getting the dissociation. We're also affecting some a system in the brain called glutamate. Glutamate's really interesting because it's the most widely um, broadcast receptor in and chemical in our brain. So we often think of like serotonin and dopamine because those medications like Prozac and Mobutrin have been around forever and people understand those, but glutamate is affects everything in the brain and it affects all the other receptors and neurotransmitters in our brain. So it's, it's a, it's highly effective in improving depression and anxiety because you're affecting so much of the brain. Is, can you take supplements of that? I thought that might've been available. Yeah, there are some glutaminergic um, supplements. They don't work super well um, because it's really, they just don't get into the brain enough. This is actually just naturally increasing glutamate in the brain um, through its own receptor pathways. Uh, so that's why it's such a strong medication because you're, you're just naturally increasing it through its own receptors. Um, it's actually not, uh, ketamine doesn't, uh, create glutamate. It just makes it release more and keeps it in the system longer. Would it be ideal for somebody who has tried antidepressants and they just don't work? And then maybe they've been prescribed mood stabilizers. Usually that's the next thing. Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, that's not really working that well. Uh, would they be a great candidate? Yeah, absolutely. So antidepressants, traditional antidepressants do not work. I'll just be honest with you. Um, the trials that were done, like doing comparisons of all the antidepressants, basically about 30% of people have a response or remission to an- the antidepressants we have today. Uh, ketamine is somewhere between 60 and 80% response wow. rate. 
So it, it doubles the response rate. So yes, people that have failed other antidepressants often will do better on ketamine um, or other medications that affect glutamate. The, um, I think the biggest factor in people doing well with it is often the younger you treat, the better. Really? Um, because people, yeah, I, I, you don't want to treat teenagers and kids with it, but young adults or uh, earlier in life, because I think when people have had depression for a really long time, it's not that they don't get better with ketamine. They actually do get better when you when you do the 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 forms on them and the the measures. But what happens is they don't recognize that they're doing better a lot of times. Hmm. Um, so we'll talk about like, hey, you know, you've you've been depressed for your whole life, you know, and now and you haven't been leaving your house and now you're leaving your house and doing stuff. And, and you'll even point out the ways that they're doing better. But a lot of times our experience has been that they really have a hard time seeing that they're improving. Uh, and that's been a challenging part with people that have been depressed for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years is just that piece. But like I said, the ketamine does work. It's just a matter of getting them to see how things are improving. But in younger people, you, you tend to, tend to see a really fast improvement and they tend to be able to go longer between treatments. So I think the younger we can attack the symptoms, the better. I believe, and I just want to confirm that you said teenagers, ketamine, not the best idea. It's, well, I have used it on like a one-off basis. Like if I have a suicidal teen, um, I'll might give them a single treatment to get them out of that suicidal state. But uh, the teenage brain is still growing so fast. Um, and if you give too much glutamate uh, during those years, it can actually affect the balance between glutamate and GABA in the brain. And GABA is our calming chemical. So if that gets off balance, what happens is then you have more anxious. They might be less depressed, but now they're more anxious. Okay. So it's really not a good long-term treatment to work with glutamate in the brain of kids and teens. But again, you can do like one-off treatments for something like suicidality. Um, and that can be highly effective. And is it basically because the not recommended overall for teenagers because their the the brain is not fully formed? Correct. Yeah, I mean, pretty much everything that we can do in kids and teens, we have to think about the fact that their brain's not fully formed until they're 25, 26 years old. So you're affecting the full development of the brain long term, not just um the immediate response that you're getting. So gotcha. you always have to think about like that long-term effect on the brain. Um, and that's been some of the controversy, even with giving antidepressants and mood stabilizers in kids is what does that long-term effect look like on the brain? Cause we really don't truly understand everything that happens. Can you walk us through the, the procedure, the administration of it? I know we, the <laughs> side effect is the, best description I have the trippy feel that you might have yeah. after it, but I, it's only, you know, 45 minutes ish, an hour, maybe mm -hmm. top, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and so from the beginning and then how many, and I understand everybody's different, but how many um, doses, because mm -hmm. I understand we front load it and then we space mm -hmm. it out. Correct. Correct. So, yeah. So how we, how we manage this is typically we have people come in for a consultation with our nurse during that consultation, she'll go over like medical history and make sure medically you're a good candidate. Then we will have you see one of the psychiatric nurse practitioners to do just to double check the diagnosis, make sure that there's no contraindicating factors from a psychiatric standpoint. Um, from there, we schedule your first IV treatment. Um, what we do is we have you come in. Um, we have you not eat or drink for a couple hours ahead of time. Uh, we come in, we have you sit in this recliner, really calming room. Uh, we'll place the IV. We give you headphones with calming music and an eye mask if you want it. Or we have like uh, lights that go on the ceiling, like stars, stuff like that. kind of just depends on what everybody likes. It's usually a darkened room. Uh, we try to keep the environment very peaceful and calm because that seems to be, seems to help with that whole experience. Um, the IV runs over about 45 minutes, like you said, uh, during that time, it's a fairly quick response into that calm dissociative experience. Um, and then at about the 45 minute mark when the IV runs off, it's actually about 
a 30 to 45 minute period of time where you feel a little sleepy or a little off. And then you feel by about that hour mark, you're ready to go. So it's about a two hour session total. Um, we recommend doing six sessions over three weeks. Most of the clinical trials that have been run ran that uh, that uh, method where they did the six sessions over the three weeks. That's called the induction phase. Based on how you do, um, and we do measures every week where we do what we call a PHQ-9, which measures your level of depression, and a GAD-7, which measures your level of anxiety. What we want to see over that three-week period is people come into that remission or at least a 50 to 60% response. If they've done that, then we start spreading the treatments out to every two weeks, then a month. Most people come in about once a month to every two months. Just depends on how well they respond, how long of a response they get. Um, some people with certain disorders might come more frequently, but that's the, the typical is like once a month. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the process. Uh, typically, I would say most people, it's a treatment. It's definitely not a cure. I don't recommend they stop their other meds because their the response is, um, it, it builds upon the other medications. So my experience is, mm. especially in people that have been on meds for a long period of time, if they try to stop their other meds, they, they decompensate faster between episodes. So we try to keep them on their meds if they're at least helping somewhat. So game changer here with, with your practice, you have a mental health practitioner on yeah. staff. There are many places that just administer the IV fusion places yeah. that are legally allowed to administer yeah. ketamine, but they're not monitoring your mental health. <laughs> Bad idea. I feel yeah. Like. Yeah. So yeah, we're a psychiatric nurse practitioner run clinic. So we have 11 psychiatric nurse practitioners that are kind of constantly monitoring um, you know, we take turns kind of looking at things and making sure things are running the way we want. Um, we also uh, have a ketamine assisted psychotherapist starting soon. So the goal is to add in that uh, psychotherapy for the second hour of the treatment for people that have PTSD or trauma to help maybe help them process things further. Also, it can be helpful in people that get really stuck. Um, Kind of like I was talking to that older person that maybe has a really good response and we're seeing the numbers, but they don't see that piece. Mm -hmm. Sometimes working with a therapist post session can help us figure out why they get stuck and help them get unstuck from whatever is keeping them from progressing. Wow. Um, loving all of this. Thank you for sharing it and uh, yeah. dispelling a lot of this. For you, you personally, Carrie, how did this mm -hmm. journey of helping others th through their mental health challenges, how did it begin? Yeah, so um, I think I knew even as a little kid, I wanted to work in medicine. And when I went to college, my original plan was to become a physician. And then I looked at some of the requirements. Um, and it's not that I couldn't do the requirements. It's just that I didn't believe in how they they went through the process. The whole idea of like doing these like 24, 48 hours on call and being at the hospital and very Western medicine focused. So I went to nursing school um, and then I went and got my nurse practitioner in pediatrics and just couldn't get into pediatrics. So I started working in mental health and really fell in love with it. I, I really wasn't where I thought I wanted to be, but I fell in love with the process and partially because I found that every day was different. You go to work and there's no two days you're going to do the same thing over and over again. Mm. Um, and so I've been doing, uh, I've been working in psychiatry since 1998, uh, doing primarily community mental health until I opened my own practice in 2018. Um, wow. And just decided to open my practice because I just wanted to be able to spend more time with people um, and not be in that rat race of having to rush, rush, rush that I found that I had to do when I worked with others. It's got to be so gratifying when you treat somebody and then they have some of those aha moments and they're starting to feel much better and, and just life is good. <laughs> How does that make you yeah, feel? Yeah. I mean, it's always exciting when you see somebody, you know, really make those big improvements. Um, but I always say that some of my favorite patients are the people that maybe they don't make the big improvements, but they work so hard and they, and they put the effort in and you can see that they're just constantly making these small improvements over time until you know, maybe five, 10 years down the road, they're all of a sudden significantly better. And that's, that's almost more rewarding because it's that time and effort that they put in, in working with you that, that gets them that long-term progress. 
For somebody to consider ketamine, who would you say is the the perfect candidate? Um, perfect candidate. My belief is somebody who's motivated to do the work, um, because I don't think any time you're doing something like this, it's not just the medication. It's also the work outside of the medication. Um, so I always tell people you're ready when you're ready to go to therapy and you're really ready to dig into those things that have been keeping you stuck mm. when you're ready to make some changes in your lifestyle. So one of the things that ketamine does is that um, by increasing glutamate, you also increase another chemical in your brain called brain derived neurotrophic factor. It's kind of like fertilizer for the brain. So it basically is telling the brain to make new connections. Um, but if you go home and do the same thing you've always done, which is like sit in front of the TV in a dark room, you're not making positive connections. You're making, again, just negative connections. So people have to be ready to change their lifestyle, go for walks, eat well, you know, find positive people and positive connections in their life. Um, and if they're willing to start making those changes, that's when I believe they're going to get the best benefit from ketamine. Interesting that you bring that up because many may feel that, oh, it's a magical drug. I just go in, get, get an infusion or whatever, however, you know, nasal spray, and life is going to be good. But no, you need to also do the work mm -hmm. and 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 realize that you have a road ahead of you because you're here at this point and be, because of we all have yeah. gone through traumas, big and little. Some of us, yeah. it affects us differently. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, we have this system called resiliency. Some people are super resilient um, and other people just are not. They, it, whether it's genetics or environment, we're still not sure what totally builds resiliency in kids and young adults and, mm. and older adults. But there's a concept there that if you're a highly resilient person, you can have lots of trauma and you just bounce back. People with low resiliency, they just don't bounce back. And so then they end up in this cycle of trauma and response. Um, and often find themselves in like multiple traumatic experiences um, because they just can't see, they actually don't see where the bad things are coming from until it hits them. Right. Um, yeah. Ketamine. There's yeah. something called S-ketamine. Yeah. What's, yeah. It, what's the difference? So S-ketamine is, ketamine is like two molecules together. S-ketamine is one of the molecules. Um, it's a substance that was developed by Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Um, and it's a nasal spray format. It has only two doses. It's a 56 milligram or 84 milligram dosing. I, I also use that in my practice. My experience has been that the esketamine is not as powerful as ketamine. Um, and I think it just depends on the patient. I have some patients that have done really well on it, but it seems to require more frequent treatments. Um, and like I said, just not as strong. So it just takes longer for people to get better. The advantage of it is it is insurance covered by many insurances where ketamine is not. Um, so, you know, I always tell people it just depends on what you can afford. Esketamine is very expensive and it depends on how well your insurance covers it. There are some people that I work with that actually ketamine is more cost effective even though the esketamine is covered by their insurance really? just because of the pocket cost. Yeah. Wow. It's so complicated with, uh, yeah. and that's for another benefits uh, insurance yeah. for another podcast. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Cause that's a whole nother world. Oh, absolutely. And we can look, we can look at that world through an employer's eyes as well, you know, providing absolutely. benefits next time we get together. Um, any other uh, final thoughts here on, on ketamine? You know, I, I just want people to understand that, you know, ketamine is, it, it is an abusable medication. Um, but if you're going to seek it out, make sure you seek it out from a provider who is trained, understands the, the concepts of how to use it, um, and is really looking out for your mental health, uh, not just giving you the substance, but they've actually done the full evaluation. They understand what, what you're working on. And then they also are giving you ideas of how to make progress when you're getting stuck um, and not just giving you the medication. It's really important to do those other pieces. Well, I'm a believer in everything is work. Everything in our lives is work. Even if you're going to hang out with your friends this weekend, you got to make some plans, uh, get people together. What time are we meeting? How are we getting there? All that. It's work. Yes, it's fun. It's work. <laughs> it's work. Even, even what can be impactful breath 
work. They call it breath work because you're yeah. working on your breathing to effectively make a change in yourself. Uh, right. It's all work. It's all work. Absolutely. It's yeah. all work. Uh, final thought here. In your practice, dealing with those that have mental challenges, what are you hearing lately? Is it anxiety has, has escalated, more depression? What What's prevalent right now? I see a ton of anxiety. I mean, I my in my practice, I t- primarily now work with kids and teens um, in my practice that's outside of the ketamine. Um, and I just see a ton of anxiety in, in this younger population. Mm. They're, they're constantly worried. Well, they worry about everything, but they worry about the world's coming to an end. And, and one of the things that I really work with them on is trying to separate themselves from social media and the negativity, because one of the things that kids can't do is they can't, they don't have the realization that media makes things bigger than they are. You know, as an adult, we can kind of like pick and choose and say, okay, that's silly. That's you, they're just going overboard to make a point versus being realistic. Kids don't have that, that marker. They don't have that ability to know that. So all it does is just constantly build anxiety um, because of that. So yeah, lots and lots of anxiety. Yeah. And and I'm right there with you as the uh, parent of teenagers, social media, fantastic, not fantastic. There is yeah. <laughs> lots of good and bad there. And especially yeah. for, for teenage girls, you know, comparing Absolutely. themselves to what they see. And then the, the bullying aspect of it just, yeah. just keeps escalating the anxiety. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I'm going to say it. It's unfortunate that ketamine can't help those. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, with kids and teens, we really do a ton of just working on um, with therapy. And then also I, I will use antidepressants and there are some other classes of meds that I can use in kids to bring anxiety down, but really, especially in that teenage girl area, it's really doing that therapeutic uh, piece where they learn to separate themselves from all that chaos. Um, Cause teen girls are chaos. They just are. They're, they're amazing, but they're, they, it's chaos. <laughs> I and the problem is they totally don't have a way to separate themselves from the chaos. You know, when, when we were kids, we'd go home and you had the one phone and your parents would say, don't get on the phone or you only had limited time on the phone. Now, now they, they don't ever get to separate themselves from it. There's no downtime. Wholeheartedly agree with you. And yeah, I mean, our, the biggest challenge when, when we were kids is like, I want to use the phone and somebody's on it <laughs> yeah. or, yep. or somebody yep. picking it up while you're uh, connecting to the dial up internet. You know, you remember that? Like, right. yeah. Don't pick yeah, up the phone. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And that was a big thing. Like, oh my that gosh. That was a huge thing. I lost but, my connection. You know, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, the reality is, you know, I, I think in some ways we were lucky because we didn't have this constant chaos. For sure. We yeah. could we could disconnect. Yeah, technology good and challenging at the same time. Challenging uh, at the same time. Yep. Carrie, how do we connect with you? If somebody, do you do virtual uh, work as well? We don't do a ton of virtual work at this point in time. Um, part primarily because I I want to do it safely, and I just haven't figured out a great way to do the virtual work as safely as I can in person. Maybe one of these days but I just haven't figured it out. But if you're in the, in Idaho on the Boise Treasure Valley area, sure. um, I can give you our, our phone number. It's 208-283-7314. And that will get you to um, either the ketamine clinic or my general mental health clinic. Do you have a, a website that somebody can go to? I do. For ketamine, it's zoraneurospa.com. It's Z-O-R-A-N-E-U-R-O-S-P-A.com. And for Integrity Mental Health, it's mentalhealthidaho.com. Awesome. Great talking with you today, Carrie. Thanks for all the, the insight and uh, the clarity. You know, a lot, we, ha- we have perceptions of, of this uh, medication, but there's a lot of good there. And I appreciate it. Looking forward next time we talk. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Awesome. We'll be right Thanks, back. Steve. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. I came out in the 11th grade. Nobody was embracing you. The kids were cruel. It was very difficult to be gay. Even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. The hard part was 
determining that I was going to do it. But I definitely didn't do it alone. At age 30, with the help of her mentor, Carissa finished her high school diploma. I have a mentor, Maria, 